Thank you, John. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very honored uh, to be able to talk about Will Cushing here at the, the Naval War College. And I'm a little sorry that I, my bad luck keeps me from seeing the museum, but I'm very happy to be here at Brett Hall. He and his father, Bobby, were two of my favorite hockey players, and uh, I'm glad to be here with him. Uh, Will Cushing, indeed, was called by Theodore Roosevelt uh, the, behind uh, Farragut as the second greatest hero of the Civil War. But if you ask Farragut, he said young Cushing was the hero of the war. So Admiral Farragut was a modest man, but that is his testimony. And the thing is, you never would have predicted it. Because, as John alluded to, uh, Will was a rascal. He grew up in uh, upstate New York in a town called Fredonia. And the, a neighbor said that Will was the pride and peril of everyone who knew him. Um, Will was the guy who you know, would get the wagon and drive the wagon too fast and up and down hills and around breakneck turns. He's the guy who would take the sailboat out on the lake on a rainy day and go through the storm and, uh, you know, shock and dismay everyone and come home laughing. He's the guy who chased snakes and chased them into their holes and then dragged them out of their holes to wring their necks. And there was never a fight that he turned down and plenty that he instigated. Um, he was um, a prankster of the first order. He, um, uh, he, he, when he was about 10 years old, he organized the boys of his age in Fredonia into a group called the Mus Group, and um, they'd march around, act like a little military outfit. Well, uh, Will and his brother went to different schools than most of the guys in the Mus Group. Uh, Will and his brother went to the school run by his mom, and the others were in the, in the, in the other school. And Mom Cushing let the students out for lunch 15 minutes before the other folks. So he would go at lunchtime, he'd go over to the other school, whistle, and all the other boys in the math group would get up and come out and leave the uh, school teacher there uh, still uh, you know, teaching addition and subtraction. Finally, the other teacher got so irritated, he went and talked to Mrs. Cushing and said, please tell your son uh, to stop doing this. And she said, if you can't control your students any better than that, you should get out of teaching. <laughs> so there. Um, Will's from an amazing family. He is, he, he, is, uh, he, he, he and his four siblings are from the second wife of a doctor who died very young. Um, his, he, was the, he was the fourth son and then he was followed by a sister. All four boys served in the military. The eldest uh, Milton was a paymaster and didn't see much action in the other uh, in the war. But the other three brothers were great heroes. Uh, we'll talk about Will, but his brother Alonzo was a hero at the Battle of Gettysburg. And the third brother, Howard, that almost nobody ever talks about, fought with distinction at uh, Shiloh, uh, Antietam, uh, uh, Chickamauga, uh, uh, the, the, at the wilderness. After the war, joined the cavalry, went out west, became an Indian fighter, and died in combat with the Indians, with the Apache in Arizona, where if you go out there, he's known as the Custer of Arizona, which I'm not sure is a good thing, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, only in the Cushing family would Howard Cushing be like, have to like, hey, you want to hear what I did? Uh, so it's a kind of an amazing family. But um, as, as a, uh, the father died young, and when Will was only four, uh, but Mom Cushing had her resources, including some family connections. She was uh, related uh, to the Adams family and to uh, pilgrims who came over, and there was a brother-in-law who had just gotten elected to Congress as part of the Know Nothing Party, and another cousin, uh, Joseph Smith, who was the commandant of the Washington Navy Yard. And between the cousin and the brother-in-law, they arranged for Will to be appointed to the Naval Academy, and uh, his brother Alonzo, who was about 18 months older, to be appointed to West Point. And um, at West Point, Alonzo was everyone's darling. He was loved by teachers, he was loved by students, he was respected, he did well. At the Naval Academy, Will distinguished himself in nothing except laying around and underachieving. He 
if you uh, look at the grades, uh, you know, the class standings each year that he's uh, through Annapolis, he's continually just skirting through, just, you know, just avoiding being uh, uh, expelled for poor grades. And his demerits, you get 200 demerits, you're kicked out of the academy. He was always 193, 195, 189. He was always right up near the top. Um, and again, though, he was, uh, he was the class prankster. He uh, was very well known uh, for uh, various antics, made him very popular with the fellows. Uh, one of the famous antics was uh, there was a army sergeant who put the midshipmen through close order drill. And he was not liked, he was something of a martinet and the uh, midshipmen really disliked him quite a bit. But he was also a man who was plagued by a stutter. And so one day they were out on the field marching and he gave the order to you know, forward march and Will was in the front row. But the man could not get out the command for the word halt. He just and Will led the men, led the midshipmen straight into the Severn River, uh, just to embarrass the sergeant. Um, so it was, it, it's, it's amazing that, um, but he was clearly very intelligent, clearly, uh, clearly a, a young man with great personality and charisma and, and, uh, and, and uh, widely liked. And, um, he ran afoul of a lieutenant commander named Rogers, who was the number two at the academy. And Rogers came from a uh, mi military elite, uh, naval elite. I'm surprised they don't have a road named for him here. <coughs> Although they do, I think, some of his relatives. His, fa his grandfather, captain of the ship in the Revolution, and his father, captain of the ship in the War of 1812, he married a woman whose grandfather captain to ship in the Revolution and whose father captain to ship in the War of 1812. He was the nephew of Oliver Perry and Matthew Hazard Perry. Did I get that right? And, um, and, and if you see the picture of him, it's in the book, he is, he is, uh, the, he looks like the very model of uh, a naval officer. Straight up and down, neatly trimmed Van Dyke. I'm um, just a handsome, um, you know, model of confidence. But he was a reformer within the Navy. The Navy was a kind of a, a, a looser organization. Um, they, it was kind of an old school place. Guys got in, they joined the Navy when they were nine as cabin boys, and they were running the place when they were 65 and 66 years old. And some of them had problems with alcohol, some were just not up to the job anymore. Uh, and Rogers was a reformer. He thought, I will reform this by starting at, West, at um, Annapolis. And Will was just not his kind of guy. And in his senior year, Will, in the middle of his senior year, Will failed a Spanish midterm. And that was all the leverage uh, that uh, Porter needed, because he had been campaigning against Will for a long time. Uh, he wrote a letter, he said, Will has a talent for buffoonery. Uh, which I think is a great phrase, and he um, went to the commandant and he got Will kicked out. Um, people were shocked at this. You know, for one thing, Will was kicked out in uh, February of uh, 1861. By that time, seven states had seceded. About a third of the naval officers had left the service in order to go south. About a third of the midshipmen at the Naval Academy had left. Uh, and it was, you know, it was not automatic that war was coming, but it seemed pretty evident that some kind of conflict was coming. And here you had a fellow who was an almost completely trained naval officer, and they just uh, tossed him away. Um, Will's cousin, the commandant of the Navy Yard, Washington Navy Yard, said, was, just could not believe it. He said, uh, to expel a midshipman for reasons academic and not nautical. You know, you could throw a kid out for a failing seamanship or gunnery or navigation or any of the tools of the trade, but to throw him out for failing a Spanish midterm, well, that had never been done before. Um, but fortunately, or unfortunately, I mean, war came. And fortunately for Will, he was able to get back into the service. 
started as a master's mate, which is the lowest ranking officer that there was, and for uh, the year of 1861 into 1862, he did all the hard work that low-ranking officers did, you know, sitting out in an open boat in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, you know, searching ships for contraband and, um, you know, hard, difficult work. Um, in the middle of 1862, they rapidly expanded the uh, size of the Navy. They needed a lot more ships. They needed a lot more officers. He got promoted to lieutenant and as at that point the, lung, the youngest lieutenant in the U.S. Navy. He got assigned to a ship, um, uh, and it was really the making of him, this assignment. It was with, um, under the, uh, he was number two under uh, Lieutenant Commander Charles Flusser. Now Flusser was actually a friend of Will's from the Naval Academy. He taught gunnery to Will. It was the only class at the Naval Academy where Will really did well. He finished third in the gunnery class. Um, and when Will was expelled, he went and stayed with Flusser in Washington. And Flusser gave Will a little book called Naval Enterprise, which was published in England, and which is really a book for like uh, you know high school students. Uh, it's, and it's about 128 pages of uh, tales of naval exploits, Admiral Nelson, Admiral Cochran, you know, people, Roman sailors and Egyptians, with many, and a lot of them had very colorful illustrations. And while Will was just laying around waiting to see what was going to happen next, he, he, he soaked up this book. And in some ways, I think it kind of uh, made him, got, helped him get his mind right. It made him think that this is what I'm missing, that this is what I'm turning, you know, was foolish enough to squander a chance to have this kind of life. Um, so he's serving with Flusser and uh, they're in Virginia and uh, in, there's somebody gets the idea to do a uh, Army Navy joint operation. Well we know how these always turn out. Uh, the idea was there was a, a bunch of Confederate forces and the Union forces were over here but there was a, water, a river called the Blackwater River that ran behind where the Confederates were. And they said, we'll send a couple of gunboats back behind the Confederates. And when the Union Army marches on the Confederates, they'll, we'll push them back into the gunboats. We'll have the rebels trapped. So uh, the gunboats went. Blackwater is a terrible river, snaky, narrow, uh, a lot of you know, overgrown logs in the water. They had to get out a lot of times and pull the ship along with ropes to get it up the river. And it's still that way, except for the, they constructed a sewage treatment plant uh, within sight of the battlefield now. Uh, but it's still narrow and twisty. Anyway, they got the uh, uh, ships in place. But as it turned out, the army failed to march. And the rebels turned around and said, whoa, what are those boats doing back there? And they attacked them. And these little gunboats were not particularly well equipped to repel uh, a charge. They, uh, you know, the sailors were underarmed, mostly had just cutlasses and pistols. And, um, and so they were under terrible fire for a while and seemed like they were going to be overrun. But the ships had brought supplies that were going to be given to the army once they hooked up with the army. And lashed to the side of the sh ship was a howitzer. And Will stepped into the line of fire, cut the ropes on the howitzer, and turned the howitzer on and broke up the rebel attack. So that was the first time that he was mentioned in official dispatches for his courage and cool under fire. And it would, there would be a regular drumbeat of these kinds of notices for the next couple of years. He fought in Virginia. He fought, uh, he had an independent command. While most naval officers at the time were part of the gun, uh, part of the blockade, uh, he was given a little tugboat and essentially sent up the rivers and bayous in Virginia, North Carolina, and told to do whatever damage he could do. So he sank blockade runners and um, stole the mail for intelligence and freed slaves when he found them. And, uh, you know, it was generally a kind of, you know, a, a raider going up and down the coast doing these things. He, uh, at one point, he, um, uh, he was in an action on the Namsekund River uh, in Virginia. 
And um, he, one of his men had gone ashore to, to hunt for some game and was killed. And uh, Will was pretty incensed by this, so he took a force of sailors and he landed. He went in, in uh, search of the Confederates who killed his, his, uh, his sailor. And they marched up to a town called Chuckatuck. It's about 80 sailors. They had a little, little howitzer with them and they found a burrow. They stole a burrow, whatever, liberated a burrow to pull the thing along. So they marched into Chuckatuck which is a town so small now, Google won't admit to knowing where it is. And uh, when they arrived in the middle of town, the town was deserted, except they found a bunch of Confederate cavalry waiting for them. And so the two sides lined up and they began shooting at one another. And um, the borough was frightened by the gunfire and just ran off, ran right at the Confederate lines. And Will said, well, where a borough can go, a sailor can go, and he ordered his men to charge on foot, and they ran right at the Confederate cavalry, and the cavalry ran away. So it's exploit like this, one after another after another. And if I went into them all, honestly, uh, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't need another hour. But it's, you know, amazing audacious attacks. You know, he did one of those um, uh, Mosby-like raids where his officer was saying, gee, I sure wish I knew what the Confederate commander was thinking. So that, that night, he uh, and got in a rowboat with 20 men. They rode over to Smithtown across the Cape Fear River, s snuck around at night, found where the Confederate headquarters was in, broke in, grabbed an officer that they thought was the leader, but their bad luck. He had gone him up to uh, Williams. Uh, uh, t anyway, he'd gone to another town. and uh, So they took this officer back and presented him to the commander the next morning at breakfast. And uh, so it was one audacious thing after another. Amazing exploits. At one point, you know, he went out looking for a ship. He got caught in the middle of a tropical storm. And his choice was either to pull up to land, where he would almost certainly be captured, or to try to navigate through the storm. And he did, uh, you know, uh, even though, you know, the chances are very small of getting one of these lubbery gunboats through. Um, so it's one amazing thing after another. In the meantime, his brother Alonzo had been building a very amazing record with the Army of Northern Virginia. He graduated in June of 1861, and in July of 1861, he was at the Battle of Bull Run. And he fought uh, with uh, McClellan's army in the wilderness, fought at Antietam, Chancellorsville, and in July of 1863, he's at Gettysburg. Um, where on the third day he and his guns are stationed in the middle of the Union line. And when Robert E. Lee sends to, says to his officers, I want you to go across the field and attack the Union lines. I want you to focus your attack on that little group of trees that you can see on the horizon. Alonzo Cushing and his guns were under that little copse of trees. As you know, the Battle of Gettysburg ends with an intense barrage, uh, lasts a couple hours, heard so far away as in Pittsburgh. They could hear the barrage. Um, five of Alonzo's guns get damaged. A lot of his men and horses and limbers get damaged. Alonzo himself is uh, shot in the, sh hit in the shoulder and in the testicles. His officers tell him, his superiors say, go back for treatment, go back for help. He refuses to. He said, in fact, he says, if you give me some of the men from this Pennsylvania group that's here, We'll move the gun up to this little wall and we will defend the line when, uh, as the rebels are coming. And that's what he did. And leaning on the shoulder of his sergeant, he continued to direct the fire of this one cannon against the rebel line as it advanced. And, um, and he lasted a good long time until another bullet killed him. And at that point, uh, with the Confederates bearing down, the sergeant ordered a final round of triple canister fired into the lines, and then the, the uh, gun was momentarily overrun. And for that stout defense of, um, of Gettysburg, Alonzo was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Obama just about a year ago. It took a long time, there was a lot of politics involved. Uh, but uh, it was, you know, for a period of time, officers didn't get the Medal of Honor, and then they became eligible. But uh, it would have taken, uh, the, you know, 
people didn't want to bother the, so the southern, the congressman from the southern states to uh, get their approval. In any event, it happened. He got his award at long last, much deserved. Will was terribly despondent, as you can imagine, having lost his beloved older brother. Uh, and he was not in action at the time. He didn't really have anything to occupy his mind. The ship that he was in command of was in um, dry dock in Philadelphia getting repairs. And uh, Will's kind of just moped around Philadelphia for uh, the fall of 1863. And there was an incident where he was checking in a, into a hotel in late October, and there was a, the gubernatorial election was taking place in Pennsylvania. Governor Curtin was a Republican and a big Lincoln man, and the Democrats were really pushing hard to get him ousted. And Will, as it turned out, was checking in a hotel where a lot of Democrats were staying, and uh, some Weisenheimer, a pharmacist, as it turned out, said, oh, you know, look how desperate they are, they're getting the... Uh, men in uniform to come check in so they can you know, pad the vote for Curtin. And um, Will beat him with a cane. <laughs> and he was arrested and taken, spent the night in jail and paid his fine or whatever. And, um, and, uh, and then he got his orders to ship out. So he went and told, he went prepared to do that. Um, but he told his number two, you take the ship down to uh, Hampton Roads in Virginia and I'll meet you there. He got in a carriage, he said, take me to the train station, but first, he made a stop at the pharmacy. He went and he beat the pharmacist again. <laughs> so, um, Will, Will would do that kind of thing. Uh, he made trouble if trouble wasn't finding him. Um, but he didn't get in any trouble for that. Um, so he went down and then was assigned to uh, the North Atlantic Blockade, blockade Squadron, which was in uh, North Carolina. And again, he had a kind of independent command where he was you know, free. He, he said that you know, he was given freedom to essentially go around and try to chase after blockade runners. And it was not a very fruitful exercise. There was a lot of water out there, and uh, it was hard to find these blockade runners. But that's what he was doing uh, uh, in the beginning of 1864. Meanwhile, Every story needs a villain, and the Confederates give us a very good one with the CSS album, Marl. Uh, after the success of uh, the CSS Virginia in Hampton Roads, the Confederates got the idea that they would build a lot more uh, ironclads. The naval yard at Norfolk had been taken back by the Yankees, so they kind of uh, decentralized. And throughout the South, people, you know, they were, every place they had some water, they were trying to build ironclads. And they built about 40 throughout the course of the war. Most of them were just terrible ships. Most of them sank right away, made with rotted wood. They were, they were pretty bad. And some that did get out saw action for a day. There was an ironclad uh, at, you know, at the Battle of Mobile Bay that you know, fought honorably for a day and then was sunk. But um, kind of the most successful of the ones that were built outside was the Albemarle which was built not even in a shipyard, but was built in a cornfield on the Tar River in North Carolina by a young 26-year-old um, you know, intrepid uh, builder named Gilbert Elliott. He cut down that fine North Carolina pine to make the superstructure. And uh, a, f a naval captain named Cook went around. He was called the Ironmonger Cabin, and he went to everybody's house and he took the hinges off the barn doors, he took the, you know, uh, studs off the uh, uh, reins of the horses and the collars and the bridles and um, melted it all down. And they ended up building a pretty fine ship, 180 feet long, 50 feet wide, good strong boilers in it, uh, six guns, uh, and in two inches, four inches of plating, and in the front, uh, a, 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 a claw, an iron claw, and it was pretty evident that the only thing that they had intended to do with that was run against wooden Yankee ships and sink them. Um, they got the idea that they were going to do a joint Army-Navy operation against the town of Plymouth. North Carolina is a hard state to conquer for a land 
force. It's got a lot of lateral rivers and it's very and marshy and it's very hard to move around. And these things also made North Carolina the, the favorite place for the blockade runners. Because once they got in, there's all these in, inlets and the outer banks and uh, islands and bays and all kinds of places to hide. But you get in the rivers, then you can get up the rivers and you can get up to Plymouth and, and uh, to the other, other towns that have railroads and you can unload your cargo and get that right up to the army uh, you know, in Virginia. So it was very important that, they, that the Union try to uh, capture North Carolina and they were not making very much success, but one place where they had success was this town of uh, Plymouth, which was about eight miles up the Roanoke River from the ocean. And they had uh, sent troops in there in 1862 and were holding it now. But they, the rebels got the idea that we would use the Albemarle to come down and bombard the, that Union uh, position, chase them away, and, um, and that is eventually what happened. But before the Albemarle could get into position to do that, it was met by two Union gunboats. And they knew that they weren't going to be able to penetrate the armor with their cannon fire, but they put a net in between them and their plan was to kind of wrap up the Albemarle and board it and slug it out like they were, you know, like Navy men had been doing for two centuries, uh, two, more than two centuries, 2,000 years. Um, you know, board it, fight it out, capture the ship. Captain Cook, in charge of the Albemarle, a little too smart to go right in the middle of the net, he veered and he plowed right into one of the ships. He ripped such a big hole in it that he penetrated so deeply into it, the, sh the, the ship sank right away and pulled the Albemarle down with it. And if the Roanoke River had been any deeper, um, I wouldn't be here today telling this story because the Albemarle would have been sunk right then. But the, r the river was shallow and it, uh, the, the ships bounced and the Albemarle bounced back up. And um, the, that, the captain of the Miami turned his fire and did the best he could. He kept shooting shells at the ship. One, he pulled the lanyard, shell bounced off the side of the ship, landed at his feet and blew him up. And that was how uh, Will's friend Charles Flusser met his end. He was the captain of that ship. Um, then the Albemarle went around, helped uh, the armed forces, the Confederate forces uh, liberate uh, Plymouth from Union hands, chased off the garrison. The Confederate high command in North Carolina was elated. They were thrilled. That's just the best news they had had in a long time. They said, let's take this show on the road. We'll send it up. We'll go capture New Bern next. So two weeks later, they ordered the Albemarle to go down the rest of the Plymouth into Albemarle Sound and then come up and go up the next river and capture New Bern. Uh, except right soon, as they arrived at Albemarle Sound, they found eight Union gunboats waiting for them. And for about three hours in the afternoon, the Albemarle fought those gunboats to a uh, standstill. Um, the, the, uh, it couldn't get close enough to the Yankee Younger boats to use its claws. The Union troops forced, the ships could not use their uh, can of fire to penetrate the armor. And so it was sort of a standstill. At one point, one of the Federal warships pulled out and decided that it was going to ram the ship, got a big head of steam. The Albemarle, uh, you know, had a hull made of pine, then there was a flat portion, and then on the top was a casemate, this sort of uh, eight-sided uh, base where the guns were located and the commands, commanders uh, operated. And the idea was this officer was going to just uh, ram, uh, hit the casemate straight on, try to kind of decapitate the ship. Uh, well, after plowing across the sea, they just missed it, didn't quite hit the casemate, ended up on the large flat part of the ship when the Albemarle turned its guns around and just um, shot the boilers out from the Union ship, and they had to kind of pull back and limp away. So then both sides uh, retreated again. The Confederates were just elated. Again, another big victory. F you know, fought against overwhelming odds. Our monster of uh, the Roanoke River prevailed. Um, and the Yankees were just desolated because they did not have an answer. They had pulled every trick they had. Somebody said, well, why don't you bring a monitor down here? 
Uh, no, we can't get them over the sound bars. Somebody said, why don't you, you know, bring the equipment down and build one here? That idea was uh, uh, rejected as well. And they really wasn't, uh, they didn't really have much of an idea of what they were going to do. And they began thinking the thing it's going to have to do is that we're going to have to send some people up there with a bomb and blow the thing up. So one day, uh, Admiral Samuel Lee, cousin of Robert E. Lee, but did not leave the uh, Union, the U.S. Navy, uh, was looking through reports and he kept saying the name of Will Cushing over and over again. Will Cushing captures this officer. Will Cushing goes on a scouting mission. Will Cushing evades capture by six troop, uh, you know, rebel ships. Uh, one amazing little tale after another. He says, bring me Will Cushing. Will Cushing shows up, he says, young man, what do you think we ought to do about this ship? He says, I think we ought to go up river and blow it up. Uh, take two Indian rubber boats, go up there with about 80 guys, you know, blow up the ship. Well, they thought about it for a while, they devised a plan, um, and they said, well, no, we'll take about 30 guys up. The plans had to be approved in Washington. The Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, had grown to know Will and had commended him on many of his exploits. He was very reluctant to send Will on this suicide mission. He, was, he had grown very fond of him, but in the end did so. And so Will got his orders, go up to the New York Navy Yard, get a couple of India rubber boats, and uh, come on back and we'll, we'll do this. He gets up to the Navy Yard, and the guy in charge of the Navy Yard says, no, you don't want India rubber boats for this. I got some new cutters, 30, 35 feet long, got a cannon in the front, you know, st steam engine, uh, it, it, it's just terrific for this kind of operation. I'll give you two of them. Will says, great, I'll take the two cutters. And he says, plus, I've got this weapon that you'll like, a spar torpedo. Fab, what am I gonna do with a spar torpedo? He says, well, it's like this. It sits on these two planks in the front of your boat, and when you get by your target, you lower it into the water, and then the bomb, the torpedo they called it, it was really like a mine, a round bomb, floats under the, um, uh, under your target. When it gets under your target, you explode it. Say, ah, great, how do I explode it? He said, well, there's a string that's attached to a firing pin. <laughs> and when it gets there, you use your string and you pull the firing pin out. He says, okay, okay and while it's, while it's floating down there, what do I do? He says, well, you know, bring a magazine. Uh, so Will takes the, a bunch of these uh, torpedoes out into the Hudson River and he tests them. And like, uh, you know, half of them the pin breaks, half of them the spring breaks, the string breaks. Some just don't go off. I'm getting more than three halves, but then finally he got one to work. He said, great, I'll take it. Um, and he takes his two ensigns and he says, take these two boats, these two cutters down. I'm gonna go up and visit my mother. And he goes up to Fredonia, New York, and, uh, and he visits mom. And Excuse me. And when he arrives, it's the same Will Cushing that had left some years before, seven years before. He comes on horseback, he rides up the porch steps and into his aunt's kitchen, says, hello, I've come to call. And all the girl cousins are laughing and everything like that and people were very amused to see him. But after a couple of days, they're, they're thinking, this is a different Will Cushing than we've last seen. He's rather more melancholy and a little more sadder. And they throw a party for him in which a bunch of townspeople come. And at one point, he does the most amazing thing. There's a girl there, 15 years old, and she's wearing a locket. And he reaches around and he unclasps the locket and puts it around his own neck. Now, he'd, knew, he'd met the girl. She was a girl you know, from the same town he grew up in but it wasn't as though they had courted or anything like that. And he said, oh, it's just a custom from the old Navy. But everyone was like, this is odd. And then um, the next morning he took his mom out in the carriage and they went up in the hills and he told her about the mission. And uh, she couldn't believe it. She said, you know, we've lost one son. Our other son is out who knows where. We haven't heard from him in months. You've been serving for two years now, and they want to send you to do a mission that eight ships and a thousand men have failed to accomplish. Why? Why? They said, Mom, they have no one else. And then they prayed. So he went back to North Carolina, 
One of the ships, one of the little cutters got lost on the way. I, uh, the ensign who was operating it uh, pulled up in the Chesapeake Bay to take a nap and he thought he was in Maryland, but he was actually in Virginia and got captured. Um, so they gave Will another cutter full of men. And on the night of October 27th, they set out to go up the Roanoke River. And they, had, they weren't going a half hour before Union pickets stop it, stopped them. You're making too much noise. We can hear you a mile away. Pull back the next morning. They muffle the engines, make them much more quiet. Set out again on October 28th. This time, far more quiet. They go up the river. They set out at 11.30 at night. It's a rainy night, so there's clouds. The, the uh, uh, Roanoke River is not a very wide river. Uh, it's lined with 40-foot cypress and gum trees on both sides, hanging over the river. So it's dark, it's enclosed, it's close. It's, and it, it, it's, uh, it, it's got that kind of confined feeling. The two little boats go for about two hours. They finally come across the wreckage of the first ship that the Albemarle sank, the Southwick. They expected to see Confederate pickets there. But in fact, there were none. The Confederates did not have any. Will ordered the other ship to stay here, to cover our retreat, if it comes to that. And he proceeded up with his one boat. He's got about 10 guys with him. Um, they get, you know, after about a half hour, they get to the outskirts of Plymouth, and they can see silhouetted against the dimming campfires and you know, few town lights, the hulk of the Albemarle in the river. Will creeps up. Will's plan was never to blow the thing up. Will's plan was to land his ship, storm the Albemarle. The tradition was never to let crew sleep on board. There'd only be a couple of guys. He's gonna overcome the guards, cut the ropes, steal the ship. Take that Albemarle back for the Union Navy. What a prize that would be. So he's about to pull up and, uh, and land his uh, little cutter when a, uh, an alert, loyal Confederate dog starts barking. <laughs> I can't do a wolf with a southern accent, so I won't try, but starts barking, wakes guards up. Who's there? What ship is that? What's out there? They don't wait, they start shooting. It starts waking up other guys. You can hear all the commotion on the banks where the Confederate army is, uh, is sleeping. Uh, and then all of a sudden there's this whoosh, and someone lit a campfire, they, a bonfire. They had built a big bonfire, doused it with turpentine and, and, uh, you know, these, uh, and tar, and lit it up just for this very purpose uh, to be able to see. And suddenly the whole little area is lit up in this broiling orange flame, and Will can see the ship, can see the Confederates on the shore, and can see for the first time that there is a log boom built around the Albemarle designed to foil this very kind of attack. So there goes any idea of, of uh, stealing the ship. Will revs the engine, he rides around the log boom, there's a lot of shouting and firing and commotion. Uh, He's looking, he's looking at the boom, he's looking to see if there's some kind of break, some kind of chink, some kind of thing where he can get through. Gets to the other side, turns his little vessel around, takes it back out, and then he turns and goes full speed ahead, straight for the Albemarle. And his idea is that he's gonna to try to aim for one of the chinks where the two logs come together, try to vault it through there, count on the moss and, and uh, stuff that's on the logs, the slime that, to lubricate, his passage over it, he hits it at full speed. Boom, there's a big crash. As you can hear the uh, boards on the bottom of his ship cracking, and he gets, and he turns out to be half right. He gets halfway across, and he is then stuck. And he's under the guns, right under the guns of the Albemarle. The new captain of the Albemarle, Warley, has by this time gotten the crew alert. They're up on the ship, and they're shouting, and Warley is saying, lower the guns, lower the guns. He's gonna to try to blow them out of the water, of course. But the guns are in the casemate, and the guns come out of a window, and he can only get them lowered so far, and not, can't quite bring them to bear. Well, he starts lowering the spar torpedo, 
lowers it into the water, lets it start floating. He stands there, he's watching it go. A bullet takes off the heel of his boot. A bullet creases the sleeve of his coat. A bunch of buckshot takes off the back of his jacket. He's still waiting. Worley's yelling. Lower, lower, lower. There's more commotion. There's more gunfire. Finally, finally. These are two men who are trapped by physics, right? Will can't do anything faster than the river can flow, and Worley can't do anything lower than the guns can be depressed. But finally, the bomb slips under the Albemarle, and Will pulls the pin. At the moment, Worley yells fire, and at the same time, there are two explosions. Will said he could feel the shot right over his head. The little cutter, there's a, suddenly a kind of opening in the sea, the little cutter gets sucked down, thrown back up, and then everybody's standing there. No one knows what has happened. But Will knows they've done all they can. He tells his men to abandon ship. Swim for it, fellows, we've done all we can. And he jumps, he takes off his coat, and he jumps into the river and begins swimming. On board the Albemarle, Captain Worley turns to his engineer, he says, go down and find out what happened. The engineer comes back in five minutes, he says, there's a hole down there big enough to drive a carriage through. And five minutes later, the Albemarle's at the bottom of the Roanoke River. Will is swimming, swimming. He's being swimming down river as fast as he can. Along the way, he encounters two of his men. Both of them die within seconds of meeting him. Uh, finally, he reaches shore. He's exhausted. He falls asleep in, uh, in uh, the reeds. Um, next thing you know, it's dawn, and uh, there's a black man standing over him, presumably a slave. And uh, Will says, do you know what happened? He says, no, I don't know what happened. He says, uh, you know, please go find out. He gives him $20. He says, please go find out. The man comes back and he says, um, that ship is dead gone sunk, Massa. And if they find you, they're going to kill you. And it was true because from where, where he was standing in the, in the reeds, he could hear the posses on both sides of the river going up and down the rebel uh, cavalry uh, looking for him. And he could see rebels in the water, too, with boats. Uh, he's, he, he spends several hours you know, cutting through the uh, brush, the reeds, the marshland. Finally, he comes upon a posse. And it all, he, all the whole time, you can hear the rebels in your body. Finally, he comes upon a posse that is not taking his job very seriously. And so he steals their boat. And he begins rowing. And rows and rows and <coughs> rows. Rows all afternoon, rows all night. Finally, about 10.30 at night, he reaches Albemarle Sand. He, sound. He's, of course, exhausted. His hands are bloody from rowing. Um, the Union Navy does not know what has happened. They have heard from the guys who were stationed to cover his retreat that there was an explosion, at which point they assumed everyone was dead, and they left. Um, but so they assumed that Will and the whole crew were killed. And um, so the, the Union Navy was just there just being alert to any, some, kind of, some sort of Confederate retaliation. So they heard the noise out there and they sent, they, they wondered what that might be. They sent an ensign out to investigate. He goes out, he finds the little rowboat and he says, Cushing, is that you? He says, yes, it is odd. He says, is it done? He says, yes, it is done. He brings him on board the ship. He makes his report. The ship sends the, signals to the rest of the Union fleet there in Albemarle Sound. And right around midnight, Will Cushing, 21 years old, has the exquisite pleasure of sitting on the deck with a glass of brandy and watching the sky above Albemarle Sound explode with fireworks that have been sent up by the fleet in his honor. So that's my story, my, that's Will's story. Um, he goes on, he, you know, he, uh, he becomes the toast of the country. He's a national hero. He's on the cover of Harper's Weekly. He's, uh, uh, you know, gets the key to the city from New York and Philadelphia. He gets parade in his hometown. Gets $50,000 in prize money, which, you know, unlike today, that was worth something. Uh, and um, and uh, gets promoted to lieutenant commander. 
At that point, he was the youngest lieutenant commander in the Navy. Um, and then a month later, he's back in action. He has more exploits. He fights at Fort Fisher. He has more exploits in uh, the Cape Fear River. Um, and then the war ends. And uh, he um, stays in the Navy. Uh, as John told you, he dies at the preposterously young age of 32 from rheumatism of the hip, which we don't know what that is now. It could have been cancer. It could have been some infection that he caught. It could have been some after effect of the explosion. But um, he was at that time a commander. Uh, he was the youngest commander in the Navy at the time. Um, so, you know, it's not ridiculous to think that it would have been Admiral Cushing at Manila Bay or Admiral Cushing in the Great White Fleet. You know, four Union generals became president, including a couple that were not entities. I mean, would that have been so out of the question? Uh, certainly, you know, he, he would have had a, f a full life of some kind of adventure, but instead he, uh, you know, he died at 32 in, in Washington, D.C., and is buried at the Naval Academy. So that's the story. <laughs> Thank you. Did he ever marry? He did marry. He married a, 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 a young lady from... Uh, a Fredonia, the daughter of a merchant. Um, no, you're usually a, a very romantic lady in the audience asks that question, but uh, it was not the girl with the locket. It was not the it was not the girl with the locket. But uh, it was interesting because this was after he had been sort of the toast of Philadelphia and New York and had visited San Francisco, where all the bells were interested in him. And talk about somebody who would have been quite the catch. Uh, and instead he went home and he married uh, Flower of Fredonia. And uh, before they could marry, he was sent on a two-year cruise to the Far East. And um, it's uh, fun to read their letters because they torture one another. She writes, oh, I went to this ball and I went to that ball and Bill was there and Tom was there and they were, my dance card was full and I barely have time to write to you. And he writes back and he says, oh, the dark-eyed Delilahs of Rio are so beautiful and did you know that in Tokyo, the men and women swim naked together and basically just, um, they tortured one another. But I guess that's what kept the attraction uh, going, I guess. Anyway, other questions? Yes? Any descendants? No, his t he, he and his wife had two daughters who um, uh, both became school teachers, but neither of whom married. And... Um, uh, in fact, when they had decided to give Alonzo the Medal of Honor some months before they actually did, but they had a very hard time finding relatives uh, alive to s accept the thing. And finally, they found some people who were very distant Cushing relations uh, living out in uh, California. But um, uh, they, it, that, the, their f will was one of five. The, the, his father had six children by his first marriage. And of those 11 children, only the last, the daughter, lived past the age of 50. So it was you know, war, disease, bad luck. One of the uh, sons from the first marriage was the law pa partner of Sam and Chase, who went on to become uh, Secretary of Treasury and Supreme Court Justice. So he's obviously someone of some aptitude. Uh, so it's a, 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 a bad uh, family with bad luck. Yes? Was the spar technique used often afterwards? I don't know how much it was. I know, you know, the, uh, I was told by a, uh, a guest at one of the lectures that the Confederates used the similar thing with their submarine, the Hunley. Um, so um, I, I don't know the, much about the history of that. I, I really don't know. How did you get involved in this particular pursuit? I'd always been interested in the Civil War. I grew up in Baltimore at the time of the centennial, and my parents um, took us to Gettysburg and Antietam and Harper's Ferry and all the places around, and I'd always been interested in it. And, I, and my interest in Cushing states, uh, dates from that time, because in uh, January, 
1961 issue of Life magazine. They did a six-part series for the centennial of the Civil War, and in that first issue, it was the highlight was a dozen paintings and illustrations that they had commissioned of great moments of the Civil War. And across the two-page, uh, you know, it was a two-page illustration of Will sinking the Albemarle. And I, you know, I was absorbed by that and remembered it. And a few years ago, um, I was doing a lot of writing about the Civil War uh, at the time of the sesquicentennial and um, looking for some larger project to work on. And no one I talked to had, had any idea of this guy. They'd never heard of him. The last biography that had been written of, about him was in uh, 1957. And it was a good book, uh, but it was just was, I could, I, uh, it was much more f formal in tone and, and use of language and presentation. And it was just not the way people r write anymore or, or like to read things anymore. And I knew I could uh, reach people. And I'm glad that W.W. Norton gave me a shot. Very nice. Yes. Medal of Honor. Maybe I missed it, but did Cushing get the Medal of Honor? No, was he received the Thanks of Congress, which was a more prestigious award that's not given anymore. Mm -hmm. During the Civil War, only about 30 men received the Thanks of Congress, and only two of them were not senior officers. So Cushing was only one of two junior officers to receive it. And you got, you know, you, Ulysses S. Grant, you get the Thanks of Congress for capturing Vicksburg. You know, David Farragut, you get the Thanks of Congress for you know, capturing New Orleans. I mean, it's that kind of, you know, uh, it's that level of uh, magnificence attached to it, really. It's a huge accomplishment that generally goes to senior officers, and, but Will got it. So he did not get the Medal of Honor. Yes? Did you ever look in further why he was kicked out of the Naval Academy? Yes, he was, um, it was, uh, it was a poor match of temperaments, I would think. Uh, and yes, it was, it was, it was this uh, failure to pass this exam that was the proximate cause. The what? Was the, was the cause, of, the immediate cause of him getting booted, failure to pass this test. Wasn't anything to do with his brothers and all the rest that put in the job? No, no. There they were. No, no. It was interesting, I mean, I, uh, I claim to be more of a storyteller than a historian, but I was able to find the documents in the National Archives related to this expulsion, because previously they would just say that it makes no sense, we don't understand why it happened. But I was able to find the actual correspondence from uh, Lieutenant Commander Porter, in which he says, uses the phrase Tala for buffoonery and, and so Porter forth. Porter the famous Porter? No, it was a different one. And, um, and, I, and it was very exciting to me to be able to find this. I went to one archive, and what I found was a letter from 1953 written by an admiral to uh, just uh, some man in Virginia, I don't know who it was, but he says, we have 11 documents related to the expulsion of Will Cushing. And he enumerated the 11 documents. But they had none of the documents there. So I went to like three other archives, and I found a total of six of the 11 there. And uh, there's still, five that we have not been able to locate. But um, well, I think we found the ones that really illuminate why he was actually kicked out. Nobody felt guilty enough to uh, give him a degree? I always thought they should, you know? I mean, the Naval Academy, I must say, uh, has um, really done a lot to keep his memory alive. He's buried in a pride of place there on uh, overlooking the Severn River. And there's a huge painting of him in the midshipman's dining hall. Um, not so handsome as this one, but much bigger. Uh, and so I, I think they, you know, the people down there are kind of uh, acquainted with his um, stature. Yes? How did the uh, letters come to be in your possession? Uh, well, you know, you, you, it's just, I mean, uh, uh, they were in the files. And so I had a research assistant in Washington working with me. And uh, see, they say that these things are in the National Archives, is what you look in the records. But in fact, there's the Navy Library is the National Archives. And the library at uh, Annapolis 
is in the National Archives. And then there's the, you know, they, they, they have four or five different depositories, and these things were spread out over all of them. So you had to go to each place and say, give me your Cushing file. And, and then you see what they happen to have. So, and, and it was, you know, spread out over all of them. Yeah. How, how big were these hooks, and what was the mechanism of using them? The hooks? The hooks. The spar torpedo thing? No, no. no. You, you said that they would use hooks to claws. To claws. Uh, oh, the, you mean the ram on the front of the album? I'm sorry, I'm not really remembering that I said hooks, but I must have. But uh, claws. The, claws. the claw. The big, the big was huge. It was... Um, um, it would reach from me to you and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it was made of uh, iron and the um, CSS Virginia also had one uh, that, it, that it used at, uh, when it came down into Hampton Roads and uh, beat up the Union How fleet. They, they would just run right at them. There's no maneuver. I mean, it was, it was uh, ugly direct. Uh, you know, smash them up warfare. It's really just an extension of the battle. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Is a wreck of the Albemarle still laid up? No, they dug it up and then they uh, turned it into scrap within a few years of... Uh, Who made that decision? <laughs> some, some ironmonger. There's a little bit of research for you. They have, an, they have a, a replica of the Albemarle there that they built a 5 8 scale. And I always wonder, why'd you build five eighths? I mean, it seems like an odd fraction, but it's there, it's interesting to see, and uh, I don't know. It's not as good as the one we have in our museum, so whenever you <laughs> come back. Uh, one more question. How many of his men survived with him? Good question, good question. We know they met two men on the way down the river who died. Those were the only two men who were killed in the assault on either side. One other man made it down river, showed up about a week after Cushing did. And the rest of his men were captured. And they must have been shell-shocked, because most of them were just sitting in the boat or hanging on the, a log boom. And uh, the attack, as I mentioned, happened at the end of October of 1864. They spent five hard months as POWs and then were uh, paroled in March of 1865 before, uh, before the war ended. And uh, each of, the, there were two ensigns. All the, uh, they did not receive any kind of decoration. All the other men received the Medal of Honor. The custom, whatever reason, you weren't giving officers the Medal of Honor. So, Cushing got the thanks of Congress, the uh, enlisted seamen got medals of honor, these two other officers, ensigns, got no decoration whatsoever. But they all got a big share of the prize money, and, um, and uh, the, each, I forget the amounts precisely, but the lowest each man got was $10,000, which was a good piece of change. What was the source of that prize money? The federal government. Yes. Yes. No, the, the, uh, the practice was you would get in. Personally, I wasn't paying taxes in those days. You would, and they discontinued the practice. But basically, they would estimate the value of the ship that was captured or sunk and give it to you. Yes, ma'am. Real quickly, this is such a fascinating story. I'm wondering, is there any possibility we might see it as a movie or see it as a Netflix? We'll talk afterwards if you want to be the producer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sell you the rights today. Uh, I, I would have thought so, but, uh, uh, you know, I had an agent look around and they said, you know, costume stories don't do well. They're looking for stories that um, can be international stories and U.S. history stories don't really do that well. I don't know, it might end up on TV. God, I hope so, but, um, but, um, but we'll talk, you and I. We'll, we'll make it work. What, what prison was I don't know. He stumped me. We can go home now.
picture of Cushy was picked up uh, at auction by as part of the collection from uh, Ambassador Middendorf. The stuff we have over in uh, Mahan Rotunda. This is one of his pieces. Right here. It looks very contemporary. Lieutenant. Oh, uh, so yeah. it is. I, I wanted to mention. I wanted to mention that um, when I was at, uh, speaking down at, at Annapolis, they had just been donated a picture, a small photograph of Cushing. And for some reason, they have not made it public yet. But it's taken about a month after he sunk the Albemarle, and he's on the ship uh, that, uh, he's on the Monticello, which he's the captain of. And he is there, and he, look, man, he looks like James Dean. He just looks so cool. He's got his head tilted back, he's leaning back, and in the corner you can see uh, Admiral David Dixon Porter scowling at him. Uh, but what are you going to say to the hero, right? Yeah. Don't pre yeah. Stop preening. Um, but it's, it's just, it, it is such a cool picture. I, if I had had it, I would have put it on the cover of the book. Uh, anyway. A couple other connections. If uh, the superintendent of the Naval Academy, when he was pitched out with a fellow by the name of Blake, who was up here when uh, they brought the Naval Academy up here. He's the one that actually tried to keep the Naval Academy in Newport following the Civil War. And uh, the other fellow, you said Porter, but it was uh, Rogers. Rogers, thank you. I misspoke. Rogers was uh, the, the, the woman who married into the Rogers family. It was Christopher Perry's daughter. So that would have been Oliver Hazard Perry's sister. And Matthew Perry's sister. So that's how they, they started that route. So. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.